Okay, um, so this is from chapter eight. It's uh, still involving only conservation of energy and anything else we learned this, uh, before conservation of energy, like force analysis. And uh, this question is, um, is an example of a question where you have to use what we call mixed strategy. So um, in some parts of the question, you will recognize that you have to use uh, force analysis. So you'll be using standard strategy. But as you are using standard strategy, you will realize that you have some missing bits of information. That's where you have to use conservation of energy to fill in those missing bits of information. So uh, let me just go get started right away. Um, so it says, um, it says a small ball of mass M is attached to a string of length A and small peg is located distance H below. So I have diagrams here. Um, and then the ball is released when the, so it's released from here. Um, and we want to locate the peg in such a way that the ball swings completely around the peg. So this would be kind of a trajectory that I'm imagining. So whatever distance you have here, this becomes the radius of whatever circle that the uh, ball uh, follows. So it says answer in terms of given quantities and oh, oh, I, I don't need to plug in any numbers. Good, uh, all right. <laughs> um, it, and yeah, uh, follow the hint, uh, hint. Oh, uh, this is question I programmed in. So hint, sometimes it uh, kind of just you know, have you going back to the textbook sections. And when I do that, it's meant to be helpful. So do, do please follow the hint. It says, um, is the energy conserved in this process throughout? And you should uh, look at this picture, kind of imagine this uh, swinging happening. And then um, hopefully after enough thinking, you realize that, yeah, energy is conserved. Um, it, uh, there's no part of the interaction in which you would say there's friction on the ball or there's some sort of non-conservative force that's doing work that would force you to say energy is not conserved. Here, uh, the only non-conservative force is really the tension force and the normal force between the peg and the string. And all those forces, if you look at it carefully, they are arranged in such a way so that as those forces apply, they don't do any work because that's the directional tension force and it'll always be perpendicular to displacement. Even down here, the direction of the tension force and displacement is perpendicular. So the tension force does no work. The normal force that's involved here also looks like it won't be doing any work. Um, in any case, the string is massless. So it doesn't have any energy associated with it physically. So yeah, so here the answer should be that yes, the energy is conserved throughout this process. And it's an important check to do whenever you are using conservation of energy or conservation of momentum to solve questions that the conservation law you think applies actually applies. Okay. Considering the geometry, what is the speed V of the ball when it is directly above the peg as it swings around the peg? Assume that the ball has enough energy to reach that position. Oh, it's question is kind of walking you through the steps. So let me do that. So it says considering the geometry. So I guess this is uh, what I'm supposed to consider when this ball swings and reaches here. This is the geometry that I'm kind of acknowledging that the distance from here all the way down here, that should be A. And oh, I shouldn't have used the label R. Um, that, um, wait, no, 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 I, that's correct label R. <laughs> so the peg is down some distance H and um, considering this geometry here, A and that H, this, I have a value for this R. R is um, uh, A minus H um, so because it's that, uh, the, that difference of distance. And the ball, it's going to be at a, um, so if we say, let's uh, just start defining our coordinate system, say y equals zero here. So the ball actually starts off from height of uh, y equals a, then when the ball is here, it has this height, it has height of two r or 
uh, 2a minus 2h. So I think that's what constraint geometry means. You kind of draw the diagram and you account for all the distances and you get that as the height of the ball. And that'll be important since that um, that is needed to figure out the change in the uh, potential energy. And it says, uh, what is the speed of the ball? Okay, so I think this is uh, where we use conservation of energy to work out uh, this unknown. So let's uh, go ahead and do that. So I have two snapshots to consider here. Uh, let me use this as a snapshot one. This is my starting point. This is one place where I know the position. I know the velocity of the ball is zero. So I know all the things about the ball. And let me use this as my snapshot too. And I've gone through this reasoning process as part of part A to say that energy is conserved. So I am fully justified in using conservation of energy principle. And when you're using conservation law um, as part of your problem solving, the very first, well, the, the very, very first step is what I've already done. Uh, uh, just um, um, justifying to myself that conservation law does apply. I've done that. And uh, the second step or the first step in the mathematical part of it is writing down the conservation law equation. So I need to write, on, write down an equation that says that the total energy as some part of the snapshot is equal to total energy in some later snapshot where I've verified from the beginning all the way to from snapshot one to two that the energy is conserved. So I need to start up with that assertion that energy is conserved. And I fill in the uh, remainder of the blanks. I start by writing down, okay, total energy. What are the parts of the total energy? I have potential energy, um, initial, plus the initial kinetic energy. And then I have uh, potential energy in uh, step, snapshot two, plus the kinetic energy in snapshot two. And I like to go through this step to make sure that I didn't forget anything. There might be some questions where you have, um, you have multiple parts of potential energy, gravitational and spring potential energy. So um, as, a, as a kind of preparation for when the problem gets more complicated, it's uh, good, to, uh, good to be in the habit of writing those things down. So I wrote this down and so both of these are, this is all gravitational potential energy. I don't think I forgot anything. So now I'm just gonna write down the expressions. The gravitational potential energy at snapshot one is where it's at height A. So the expression should be mg times the height A plus the kinetic energy. It's one half mv squared, so that's zero. The speed at that position was zero is equal to the gravitational potential energy at snapshot two. So I have that height there, that's why I wrote it down. I need it now, mg 2a minus 2h plus the kinetic energy. Here now I have some sense that it's moving with some speed of v. So I'm gonna write that down, one half mv squared. So I have an equation here and it looks like I have only one unknown. I have, um, I have unknown V and that's it, I know everything else. So I think I'm just gonna solve for V. Uh, let's see, a uh, mass cancels out. So I don't have to do a lot of work with that. Uh, I guess I need to move this one over. So let me write down a version of the equation with a V squared on one side. So that's a V squared is equal to, uh, I, uh, yeah, uh, G A minus G times 2A minus 2H. Um, oh, I need to multiply both sides up by two to get uh, V squared by itself. So times two. And, um, oh, and so I just take the square root to get rid of that square. So this is the expression for V. And if I want you to, I can simplify this a little bit. I can factor out G to get something like, this is equal to square root of 2G uh, times still square root of A minus, um, uh, A minus two. Oh, so I guess that uh, actually simplifies down to a point where it's just 
minus a. So I have minus minus plus. Um, so 2h minus a um, square root. Yeah. All right. I, I guess this is a simpler. And uh, so the system will accept your answer in this form. If you answer like this, it will accept that answer. So, you know, I'm not requiring simplification in any way. But I would encourage you to try to simplify whenever it looks like things might simplify as a way of trying to get algebra practice as you go. Because um, really the one number one math skill that matters now and really throughout your academic career and possibly even your professional career is your algebra skill. And um, even though there are software like Mathematica that can do a lot of that for you, developing that intuition really involves you developing your own algebra skill. So, so that should be the answer. Let me just <laughs> make sure I um, have that correct. And um, that it, I'm just going to type it in, square root of um, 2G. You can do times, or I think if you just do 2G, the system will recognize that square root of 2h minus a. Uh, okay, no syntax error. Um, but that's not correct. What did I do wrong? Um, so, okay, the uh, next simplification I did was I just uh, separated out the other square root. That should be fine. Huh. Um, Okay, this uh, is probably some sort of software error, unless, uh, okay, I'll, I'll just investigate that offline, because um, when I pulled this out of, when I separated that as part of its own square root, that shouldn't have made a difference. But somehow it makes a difference, because something's wrong in the software, <laughs> so I'll investigate that after this virtual class session. Um, and so this is where it helps that you have practically unlimited attempts. You can kind of go back and so here there's no reason why uh, this is graded as uh, correct and this is not graded as correct. Something's wrong with the software. I'll look at it and fix it. Uh, this should be correct. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, let me finish this up. See what is the minimum speed of v mean the ball needs to have so that the string remains taut or barely tall when the ball is directly over the peg uh, as it swings around the peg. The minimum speed will vary as a functional parameter such as A and H. Uh, um, yeah. So, um, ah, so this is the part of the question where you, um, you need to use the, new, um, the force analysis standard strategy because and this takes some practice and in reading the problem questions to realize that's what it is. Because really the part of the question that um, would have given you the hint is this portion. The ball needs to have so that string remains taut. And if you read it carefully, this is giving you some information about some force. And the information you are given is that tension is greater than or equal to zero. Because the string will remain taut only as long as there is a tension. So the problem is telling you that you want the condition so that uh, tension is at least uh, you know, barely above zero. Or so what that really means is you could treat tension as almost being zero, but just barely becoming zero. So once you realize that the problem is specifying condition about force, then uh, you can figure out, oh, if it's about force, then I need to use a standard strategy. And, but kind of re reaching that point is where you need to practice in problem solving. So I've reached that point. <laughs> so let me actually uh, now uh, do that. So I'm gonna start out with a free, um, I'm gonna draw two different types of diagram. So one is the diagram that I need to draw just because my screen is not big enough, which is um, of, the, um, of the ball that is swinging. So it's gonna be here, swinging here, moving at some speed of V min. And um, I know this distance here, R, which is going to be uh, A minus H. And um, 
yeah, I guess that's all the geometry factors I need. And this is moving in circle. And the free body diagram for this scenario is I have, um, so I'm drawing free body diagram of the ball. So I have gravity pulling it down, mg. And just for the sake of uh, completeness, if there were tension, tension would be pulling it down. And um, this is the question I always ask myself at each step of drawing free body diagram is, did I draw all the forces? And here, it feels like I drew all the forces because I drew gravity, which is the force that should always be there. And I drew the tension force, which is the only contact force that can be on this ball. So I think there's no other additional force I can draw. And, and that's correct, Th that those are all the forces. And this is where you need to have a good, um, a good kind of sense of intuition for circular motion, uh, which is what we covered right before chapter seven and eight. So that uh, you can realize that in this free body diagram, yes, it's uh, okay to have just those forces because here you don't have a net zero, you don't have zero acceleration. Here you do have downward acceleration, which is centripetal acceleration, mv squared over r. So you have an object that's moving in circle, so it is going to be accelerating towards the center of the circle. So you draw these forces and you uh, recognize that these forces are consistent with the acceleration you need to have. So you say you're done, I have all the forces I need. So uh, let me make this a little bit easier for myself. Since we are going to be setting tension, uh, we are going to say that tension is going to zero for the minimum velocity. I'm going to erase tension force. I don't need that. So uh, that this makes my Newton's second law equation easier. My net force is just the gravity, mg. And that's uh, going to be equal to mass times acceleration or just writing in my known acceleration at this step is going to be, oh wait, uh, acceleration is just V squared over R, not M. So the acceleration is going to be V squared over R or R being A minus H. Let me just plug that in now, A minus H. All right, and this V is the minimum velocity. So um, I guess I can solve for that now. Um, so the, I can cancel out the mass and uh, let me solve this for velocity here. Um, let's see. Solve it for velocity. V min is equal to, I move A minus H over. So that's uh, G times A minus H, parenthesis. And then getting rid of the square, I have square root. Let me plug that in just to make sure that the system accepts that it's correct. Uh, <laughs> there might be another uh, software error thing that I need to work through. So we'll see. That's a, um, all right, and this, so that's no trouble. So, okay, so that's the minimum velocity. So once you do through part C, then part D is relatively easy because, um, you know, I mean, it says as much, you know, considering your answers to B and C above. So uh, what you're gonna do is, okay, I know this is my, uh, value of V, no matter um, whether we are at the minimum or not. And, but when we are doing D, we are assuming that, assume that the ball has enough energy to reach that position. And this is kind of the place where it has the minimum possible energy to actually reach there. So what I'm going to say is that these two are equal to each other. That gives me an equation um, in terms of um, now unknown H and everything else, so I can solve for H there. So, uh, so let me write that. Let's see, um, let me scroll down and start out with that equation here. Um, square root of, I'm gonna use the simplified version because this is correctly simplified, it's not wrong. Uh, 2G times square root of 2H minus A um, is equal to square root of G times A minus H. You see some things cancel out, G cancels out. So it doesn't matter, um, this a geometric thing we are trying to determine, it doesn't matter what planet you are on. Um, I, let's, let's 
good. Um, and then I think that's uh, it. Nothing else simplifies. So I'm going to try to get h by itself. It looks like the very first thing to do is a square both sides. That will get me uh, two times all this, which will get me 4h minus 2a is equal to what's on the right hand side here, a minus h. So let me move h over, 5h, move a's over, is equal to 3a. So I guess that gives me h. It's uh, 3 fifths of a. Let me plug that in to see if that's correct. Um, if uh, that is correct, then it also serves as a second check that I simplified it correctly. Uh, 3a over 5. Okay, um, yeah, so, so yeah, that's the question. It's a multi-part question and it can be challenging because you are required to use multiple different um, problem solving strategies. And at least for this question, it's uh, written as a kind of a tutorial style as in it walks you through the steps. Now, uh, what I hope you are able to do at some point is where you can just, if, because someone could have just asked the part D as the very first question. If you are asked to that, then I want you to be able to kind of work out all these steps that you need to go through. So that, I mean, you know, part of it, it's a simple question and the answer you get is a simple answer. But it takes a lot of uh, knowledge and skill with the problem solving to get to that simple answer. Um, 